Open Door Baptist podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. To take your Bible, go to Luke chapter number 15, if you would. Luke chapter 15. There is a Bible in the pew in front of you if you don't happen to have one uh, with you today. Uh, you can use the one that's provided for you in the, uh, in the pew there. And we're going to be at Luke chapter number 15. I believe also there are some notes in the, uh, in the bulletin if you would like to use those uh, this morning as we consider this thought, this passage, familiar passage to many. I told my wife uh, earlier this week, I have referenced this passage many times just in preaching, but I've never preached this passage before kind of it's in its entirety. And a matter of fact, even today I won't because I won't be dealing with the, the brother uh, who's mad when the prodigal comes home. We'll just deal with the first part of it here this morning. There's so much in here, and, and if you are saved, then maybe you can see yourself at times uh, where we've went wayward. Uh, we've been prone to wander, if you will, and, and we see ourselves in that passage. And if you're here and maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can also see a picture in this passage of a loving Father who's full of compassion and grace and the goodness of God uh, leads us to repentance. And we see that here in the passage as well. So again, there's the word of God doing its work. And uh, it just it's so applicable in so many different ways. I want to start reading, if we could, verse number 11. We'll read a few verses here. And then we'll have a word of prayer together here this morning. Start in verse 11, if you would. Notice the Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And keep in mind, he just got done dealing with the lost sheep in the first seven verses of this chapter, then the lost coin, and then he deals with the lost son in the remaining verses. He says, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And when he had joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he had sent into him the fields to feed swine, and when he had fain filled his belly with the husk of the swine, did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. Uh, notice, if you would, verse number 18. I will arise and go to my father. I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. That's similar to Psalm 51 is a good example. And, and, and just as a side note, kind of just came to my mind as I was reading this passage. When we do sin, I think it's imperative that we go to God and we call it for what it is. And we tell him, just as David did in Psalm 51, I've sinned. Uh, maybe specifically, here's what I did. Acknowledge it before God. Notice he says, against heaven and before thee. And no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and are no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, 
and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be merry. Uh, let's pray together this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we have set aside uh, during the week to come and worship you. We thank you for the songs that we've already heard in the choir, the special music. And as we come to this portion of the service, uh, we look to you and ask for your guidance and your direction. And I pray that this particular message that you laid on my heart would fall on good soil. And I have no doubt that there are so many principles in this text that are applicable to each person here or in the service to follow. And I pray that we would listen and respond accordingly. I pray if there's somebody here not saved today, they'll trust the finished work of Jesus Christ as their only hope for heaven. And I pray if there's somebody that has went down the wrong path, that they've already named the name of Christ, they're a Christian, but they're heading down the, the wrong path. It's the path of the prodigal, which leads to destruction, that the Spirit of God would grant a wake-up call and understand that there's a Father uh, full of compassion and grace and long-suffering waiting for them to come home. And we'll thank you for it and give you the glory, for it's in Christ's name we pray and amen. The path of the prodigal is the title of the message. Uh, now, Lord Jesus Christ, as you study your Bible, you'll see that he is just the, he's the master painter. He paints the picture as he does so well, as he takes particular situations um, in life. He'll say, consider the lilies, and he'll say, the sparrows, or here he paints a picture of two sons, and he just is the master painter of the pictures. And in this passage, we see the Lord Jesus Christ kind of put the background on the canvas. And as you read the story, you can see the picture begin to unfold a little bit more as he puts some color on it. You see, first of all, notice if you would at the beginning, kind of a, it's a lovely home because it represents the father's home. In that home, there's a certain man that's a picture of God the father. That's so many types in this passage, it's, it's amazing that we will see. He has two sons. In the story, we see the father's love, we see a wayward son, we see the compassion of the father, and then later you see, if you keep reading, a self-righteous brother. But I want to pick up in verse number 11 where our Lord begins to add some color to this picture, and notice in your notes, if you would, right off the bat, we see a tough demand, a tough demand. Look, if you would, at verse number 11. A certain man had two sons, and it says this, And the younger of them said, un, uh, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Now, the request of this younger son was for his share of the inheritance. And according to, if you read your Bible in the Old Testament, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse number 17, Technically speaking, that, uh, that's a proper request, maybe not at that particular time, but uh, it was for him. A third of that of his father's was to be given to him according to the book of Deuteronomy. Nonetheless, it was kind of a surprising request, especially as it says the younger son, uh, no doubt uh, not ready to receive a third of his father's inheritance. It's a surprising request, and really by making such a demand, you kind of get the sense he's saying, I'm tired of you. I want to be free from your control in my life. I want to be free from it. And imagine if you would such a claim. It was a, a self-centered demand. Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Look, notice those two words. I underlined them. It says, give me. It says in verse number 12. His focus was on me. And I want to just pause there for a minute and, and again bring to the surface and to light how much the crux, the essence, if you will, of Christianity revolves around it not being us, but being him and other people. Um, you read, the, uh, you read the, the book of Philippians, you find Jesus Christ kind of the greatest picture of humility. And, and, and he took upon himself 
the form of a servant and made of himself of no reputation and all those things we see. Our Savior was the perfect picture of somebody that did not center his life around himself, but this younger son was very selfish. And you can see it clearly in the text. It's me. His life is all wrapped up in himself. He cares for nobody else and especially the Father. That's clear from our passage but notice, if you would, in the ensuing verses, the father's gracious. He could have refused him. He could have kicked him out of the house, but he doesn't. He merely does what the son asks and gives the boy what he asks for. And the Bible says he divided unto him, unto them, his living. Literally, the father, no doubt, has poured his life into his estate, into what he had, so he had something to be able to give to his children and hand it down to them. The younger son wanted what the father could give him, but he didn't want the father. I'll just pause there for a minute. Think about that thought. The younger son wanted what the father could give him, but he didn't want what? He didn't want the father. And this pictures many things. It pictures many things. It, it, it pictures, first of all, uh, it could picture a lost sinner. See, that's the thing about this passage. And all the commentaries I read and different stuff, some say it's a picture of a lost man that gets saved. Others say it's a picture of uh, a saved child of God that just went wayward in the world and then by the grace of God came home and there's all this debate. Listen, I see both. I see both. And uh, J. Vernon McGee uh, was saved when a preacher was preaching this particular message. And so I think as the word of God is, can be used uh, really in many different ways. So this, in this sense, I think if we consider that thought, the younger son w w wanted what the father could give him, but he didn't want the father. Pictures a lost sinner. The lost person takes no thought for God. Their attitude towards God is give me. And not even, listen, picture lost people in this world. It's not even that they acknowledge God but they know subconsciously that there is a God. They want his air, they want his food, they want his water, they want his time, they want to live in his world, but they don't want, it, they don't want him to be involved in their lives. That's really what it is. When God made man, he literally poured himself into man. Picture, if you would, Genesis chapter two and verse number seven, the Bible says, and God breathed into his nostrils, speaking of Adam, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And so literally, uh, we see in Genesis 2 that God made man, he poured his life into man. Many times man wants what God can give him but they don't want him. That's a tragedy, that's a tragedy. No wonder the Bible says in Psalm 14, verse number one, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The next time you meet somebody or you hear somebody say, well, there's no God. I mean, Psalm 14, one, it says explicitly, it calls them a fool. A, only a fool would say there is no what? Only a fool would say that. Keep this in mind. If you want to live your life like there's no God, he will allow you to do that. See, see listen, the father did not force himself on the son. Uh, picture that for just a minute this morning. He didn't force himself. He didn't push himself on him. If you want to take all that he can give you without acknowledging him, he'll let you do that. But you need to know there's an end uh, to such a life. If it's a lost person, it's a lake of fire. If it's a wayward son who's already accepted Christ as their savior, but they're just living in the world, uh, Deuteronomy says, consider your latter end. And so you know there's an end result. And so both aspects of it when we don't acknowledge God. Notice if you would, number two, uh, in your notes here, a rude awakening, a rude awakening. Look at Luke chapter 15 and verse number 13. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance, what's the next three words? So it's a rude awakening. Because look at verse 14. He'd spent all and arose a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want. And went and joined himself to a citizen of the far country and, and sent 
him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. The son gets what he wants, but soon finds out that all that glitters is not gold. Can you picture the story as the Lord paints the picture here? Here's the son. He's saying, give me the portion that falls to me. And the father gives it to the son. And the son's saying, listen, I don't want anything to do with you. Uh, I'm going to go. I, I see what's going on. I've, I've caught it on the news. And I hear the rumors. And I know about the parties. And I know about the girls. And I know about all that's taking place. I'm going to go check that out. Basically what he's saying. And he says, I don't want anything to do with you. And so the father gives it to him. And what a rude awakening we see in the particular passage here. All that glitters is not gold. Do you know the, the world paints a picture, doesn't it? Sin paints a picture, doesn't it? It just kind of, uh, the devil will always paint something that looks a certain way that's so appealing to the flesh. And it kind of, but it never shows you the end result. It's kind of like fool's gold. And, it, it, and you think it is, but it's not. And that's really what you see here. The result of sin's choice. Look at verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and wasted his substance with riotous living. He takes his father's grace and he squanders it. You know, how? By living a self-indulgent life. The words riotous living literally mean totally given over to sinfulness and wickedness and ungodliness. In other words, when the boy left home, he also left behind all of his moral restraint. Uh, so the term we would use is he, he let his hair down. Now he's no longer underneath the father. He can go out in the world and do whatever he wants to do. And so uh, he lets his hair down. And he's just, there. He, when he left the father's house, he left his moral restraint. It's all just... Uh, whatever he wants. He lived a, uh, such a, a life that he just to gratify himself, every impulse of the flesh he was willing to respond to. I want you to look real quick. Hold your place there. Go look at Hebrews 11. I'm going to show you just a quick thought here. Hebrews 11, in this context, he may have enjoyed himself temporarily. I think this is a sober truth for all of us. Hebrews chapter number 11 Hebrews 11, look if you would at verse, well, look at, uh, look at verse number 25. He may have enjoyed himself temporarily, but keep in mind, I want to say this as we look at Hebrews eleven twenty-five: 25. Sin is pleasurable. Sin has, there's a, there's a joy, uh, not a joy, a pleasure associated with it. Uh, that's, why, that's why Proverbs says stolen waters are sweet. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. See, but it doesn't stop there, does it? The proverb doesn't end there. When, that, when the end result of that's all, all done, it's like gravel in the mouth. Uh, uh, he knoweth not that her, gaps, her guests are in the depths of hell and so on as you read through Proverbs. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 25. Uh, this is Moses. He says, choosing rather to suffer affliction uh, with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin. And I just want to say this as a side note and picture this with me if you would. So the Bible makes it clear that sin is pleasurable. But does it not say that it's only for a season? Is that what it says? It's only for a what? There's a time frame. And in just a little bit throughout this message here today, we will see how the way of the transgressor is hard and what sin can do to a life and how it starts out small and how it can escalate and what it can do. And keep in mind, this is so important. Some never make it back. Do you know somebody that used to serve God, that used to name the name of Christ, that used to be in church, that used to, you know, uh, and, and, and that now they're out there, they're that prodigal, they're that wayward, and, and it may not be, so we, well, I'm not going to go to the, I'm done with the parties and the women and the, all this, I'm done with that, I just have my, listen, it doesn't matter if it's exactly that, as, as long as, if, if we've left the father's house and we're out from underneath his protection, we're a prodigal. Any way you look at it. 
So look at it again, Hebrews 11, 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, so Moses made this choice, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses made a conscious decision and said, I'm not going to enjoy the, I'm, I'm prudent enough to know the end result of that. So he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Eventually his money, go back to Luke 15 if you would, eventually his money ran out. Along with the money, he lost the friends who had helped him spend it. Can I pause there for a minute and just say there's a lesson in that? Who are your true friends? That's a fair question. Your, your true friends, may I submit to you this morning, are the ones that are there when you have nothing. When you got nothing. They're there for you. And this guy, no man gave unto him. Your true friends are the ones that love you in spite of what you may or may not be able to give them. The far country had beat him up. He found out too late that sin carries with it a price tag. And, and, and let, me, let me say this. I told Pastor Kennedy this. I said, uh, when I was done with this message, I said, you know, I, I, I'm, help me with an illustration or something here. And I said, I need some levity. I said, because this is a very sober message. It's just sober. I like to have a little fun and joke a little bit and icebreaker, this, that kind of, you know. But I just, it's a sober message. But it's, I'll tell you, if you listen attentively, if you're in the Father's house right now, it'll help you to never be that prodigal. If you are that prodigal, you say, well, I'm in church. I can't be that prodigal. Don't try to kid yourself, <laughs> Okay. Physically, you can be here, but spiritually, you can be anywhere. And only God knows your heart. So, uh, it, I, I don't ever apologize for a message. This is the message the Lord laid on my heart. I know this, that it's a sober message, it's a true message, and it's a helpful message if we'll uh, allow God to speak to us. Sin, notice if you would, bring separation. The boy finds uh, himself broke. If you notice in, in the uh, verse 14, broke alone, miles away from the father who had done nothing but love him. He also, leaned, not only does sin bring separation, but it also brings sorrow. Look at verse 14. He began to be in want. Listen, life had been turned upside down for this young man. Everything changed. Famine arose, the money was gone, all his friends were gone, and here's this boy. When the music stopped and his friends left, he found himself in need. It robbed him of everything of value that left, and really kind of left him hopeless and helpless, kind of in that far country. This is how sin treats all of its victims. That's what it does eventually. It'll promise you the world, but it can only deliver hopelessness and desolation and death. Look if you would at James chapter 1. Hold your place in Luke 15. Real quickly, just I have a couple references, maybe one or two other ones as, we'll, as we jump away from Luke. But uh, look at James chapter number 1. Hebrews, James chapter number 1. I want you to consider just, again, as we talk about the ramifications of sin. Luke chapter number, or I'm sorry, uh, James chapter number 1. Look at verse 14. This is a, a perfect analogy and kind of shows you the, the, prog uh, the uh, progression of how sin works. Look at verse 14. But every, uh, James 1, 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then it says in verse 15. Then, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth what? And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth forth death. You know, we, we always say it, it pays to live for God, and it does, but it also pays to live for the devil. We, we, what do you mean it pays? It pays, it literally. There's, you live for the devil, you live for the world, you live for self, all of those things, you live for your flesh, all of that, it pays. There's a, you get something, there's a wage associated with it. There's dividends that we get if we live for the world and live for the flesh and w live for the devil. It's dividends that you can't even imagine. You get broken lives, ruined marriages, shattered dreams, 
damaged trust, health problems, hopelessness, desperation, discouragement, all of that is a dividend that you get when we leave the Father's house. It pays. Someone rightly said that sin will take you farther than you want to go, make you stay longer than you want to stay, and always make you pay more than you want to pay. Absolutely. It's, you, it, it, listen, you can't sow seeds to the flesh and seeds to the world and then pray for a crop failure. It doesn't work because Galatians 6, 7 will always be true. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's kind of like we cling to John 3, 16. Uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And we cling to that. But that, you know that Galatians 6, 7 is just as true as John 3, 16. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So because of his foolish decisions, he found himself in a mess. Go back to Luke chapter number 15. He learned some valuable lessons. Sin brings shame. Look at verse 16. If you would, back in Luke 15, look at verse 16. It brings shame. It brings shame. Here, here it is, verse 16. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. Here's a Jewish boy who finds himself in the pig pen. You understand Mosaic law, that they're not even to be around pork. <laughs> and here he is slopping with the hogs. The shame associated. Here's a guy who had a dad that was well off, who ended up taking everything he had and going to the far country and spending it all, and now he winds up in the pig pen. And that's where all of us will wind up if we leave the Father's house. Listen, if any man name the name of Christ, let him depart from iniquity. And sometimes God allows that to happen and we end up wallowing with the pigs because of God's love. See, I, I don't believe, I'm not one of those that believe that uh, if you go away from the Father's house that you no longer are his son. I don't believe that. I think that's a heretical doctrine. Once your name is written in the book of life, once your name is there, it's there. Amen. Period. It's there. You can't lose your salvation. But God loves you so much that as a father would his own son at given times, there's consequences sometimes for our actions. So our Heavenly Father sometimes allows things to get our attention. And you say, well, what are others? I have no idea. I have to worry about me and what he allows in my own life. So I make sure that I stay underneath the provision and the protection of God Almighty. I often think of Psalm 91. The Bible says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I always want to be in that secret place because I always want to be under that shadow, that provision, that protection of the Almighty God. How about you? That's what I want. <laughs> because if I get out of that secret place, then I'm, then I'm out from underneath that protection and I need it. I, I want it. I desire it. For a Jewish man to stoop to this level would mean that he had reached the very bottom of the barrel of his life. It's against the Mosaic law for Jews to go anywhere near the pigs. You see the shame of a wasted life here. Wasted opportunities. Notice also, real quickly here, sin brings a pain. He's got no home, no help, no hope. No one cares for him at all. Starving. Would have eaten the pig's food if he could. But he's suffering because of the choices he made. See, that part of, part of the, here, let me say something real quick as a side note here. When you see what we would call in America, first of all, in America, poverty is different than what you see. I've traveled to enough countries to see real poverty versus what we see here. That doesn't mean that there aren't people in this country that are in need, so please don't misunderstand me. But there's different kinds of poverty is all I'm trying to say. But sometimes when you see people, and this doesn't mean you can't help them, but you see people in situations that, well, maybe they'll choose not to get a job or they've just, they've made such poor choices. Now they're dealing with the ramifications of those decisions. That's why the book of Proverbs says, consider the cause of the poor. A lot of people miss that one thought. 
So there's your discernment. There's your discretion. Consider the cause. Is it because they genuinely cannot get a job and help themselves? Or is it because they just choose not to and the choices they've made have put them in those situations? I want you to look real quickly at Proverbs 13. Speaking of Proverbs, only probably one or two more verses uh, that we'll look at here. Proverbs 13, hold your place in Luke 15. This man is suffering because of the choices that he made. Proverbs 13. And I want you to notice, if you would, in Proverbs 13, one verse, one verse. Uh, Proverbs 13, Proverbs 13. Look, if you would, at verse 15. Proverbs 13, verse 15. Good understanding giveth favor, notice if you would, but the way of the transgressor is what? Suffering, sin's not changed, it always brings suffering. The way of the transgressor, it's hard. You can tell many times by, now again, it's never infallible, but sometimes you can see, sometimes you can see the toll that sin has brought upon a person's life. It just, some, have you ever heard, have you ever said before, man, it sure looks like they had, a, they had a hard life. You ever said that? The way of the transgressor is hard. I'll give an example. Yesterday I was uh, talking, uh, handing out some Real Hope Bibles and met this person. This person said, you know, I was raised in church and this and this and that, and then kind of went through a litany of things, of choices that they had made and just kind of had went to the far country and I'm just telling you from experience, and, I, and, and, and especially with the litany of things that were told me that they're going through, and I could just look, as I prayed with this person, I could just see how sin had taken a toll on every part. It's just, it's just sin. I was reading Charles Haddon Spurgeon just two days ago, and he said that sin is insane, and it causes people to do crazy things. And the way of the transgressor is hard. And here's a young man that made choices that put him in a situation he would have never thought that he would be in. Sin had brought sorrow and shame and separation. I want you to notice thirdly, if you would, in your notes here, a humble homecoming. A humble homecoming. Look at verse 17, if you would, in Luke 15. The Bible says, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. If you notice in verse number 17, he says, when he came to himself. Pause there for just one minute. That's, that right there is what it takes sometime, whether you're in church or out of church or, you're, or, or you, you, you've got out of church, you've closed your Bible, you've got out of prayer, you've got out of fellowship, you've, and, 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 and you know, and, and that's the great thing about being a, a child of God is you know, you know, because the Holy Spirit works in our hearts where we may not, we may not be where we ought to be. And this man, it says, and he came to himself. And that is what needs to take place sometime is that where you, you look up, and that's what this young man did, no doubt, and he came to himself. Now, I've seen sin destroy lives where it just seems like that person, it, they're just, if you ever say, he gone, just gone. That's where, number one, a person has silenced the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They have a seared conscience, and you take that principle in Genesis 6 and verse number 3, the Spirit of God shall not always strive with man. And so some people can get to the point where they've silenced that conviction of the Holy Spirit, but here's a man, by the grace of God, he came to himself. And sometimes, listen, that's what we need to do is find out where we are and look back to the Father's house. And I, I would say, uh, before it's too late. He hadn't been thinking clearly, obviously, but the fog began to lift. He realized a life that he'd lived put him in the situation that he was in. And yeah, I already mentioned this, the devil paints the picture that there's no consequences for your action. Live it up, and the world's got all their mottos of sow your wild oats and all this kind of stuff, and that's just, it's just, again, contrary to the Word of God. Notice, if you would, verse number 18 
in Luke 15, verse 18 and 19, you see the son's determination to get home. He makes up his mind to go home. He's tired of the far country. You know what he does? He longs for the fellowship again with his father. He wants to go where he can be loved and fed and cared for. You can see the change. Here's the example. Watch this. Look, look, at, look at the verse in Luke 15. He, at the very beginning, look at verse 12. He says, give me. He says, give me. Now, I want you to see the change. He returns home saying, make me. Make me one of thy hired servants. You see that? Isn't that interesting? Uh, I'll even, let, me, let me find the exact verse. Where is it at here? Uh, 19. Thank you. So, so watch. Here's the change. This, this is called, this is a picture here of repentance. Watch this. He left, verse 12, give me. He comes home. Make me. Make me one of the hired servants. So you see this change taking place. I, I, I kind of get, he, he left the father's house not wanting to be under his authority. Now he's willing to be a slave. He's willing to confess his wrongs and so on, and the Lord accomplishes it. Really, this whole thing through the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Notice verse 20, his son goes home. You see in verse number 20, and he arose and came, and, and came to his father. He goes home. He's on his way back. He doesn't know what's going to happen. For all he knows, he may be rejected. For all he knows, he may be humiliated. He doesn't know what the response is going to be. And may I say to you this morning, there are many, many that are, are un, unwilling and, and afraid of going home because they don't know what to expect. Can I say Romans chapter 2 says this, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't add the next verse that says, but after the hardness, an impenitent heart, meaning a non-repentant heart, what happens is you treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. And so you see that in Romans chapter number two. So the Spirit of God knows exactly what we need. And here this young man makes his way home. Would you notice lastly uh, a joyful reunion? Look at verse twenty. A joyful reunion. He arose, he went to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. What a picture here. He didn't know what he was going to find, but what he found, I think, is in, what he found is incredible. He found a father who had been longing for his son, who'd been looking for his son, who'd been waiting for his son. I think of that passage where the Bible says, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of Israel, he says, all day long have I stretched forth my hands to a gainsaying and to a disobedient people. Just the open arms of the father that's there. We have a merciful God. We have a loving God. We have a God full of compassion. And that's what this young man found. The father wouldn't even allow his son to finish his speech. J. Vernon McGee says he's convinced that this boy prepared his speech all the way home. I'm no more worthy to be called, I say. I'm no more worthy to be called. I'm no more worthy. He's just, he's got it all in his mind of what he's gonna, t what he's gonna say. But notice in the verse, in verse 20, it says he ran. The father runs. This is considered undignified in this culture for a man to run. Notice he kissed him. The verb kissed in the present tense, not just one kiss, but a continual kissing as he fell upon his neck because of how excited and, 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 and elated he was to see his son come home. The ultimate sign of acceptance by the Father. And you know what? When we return home, the Father does the same thing. He restores fellowship to us. Does the, does the Bible say if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? The same context of that passage says if we say we have no sin, right? So the whole context is fellowship. It's all about fellowship. That's why confessing sins, although hyper-dispensationalists would teach that, well, it's already taken care of the cross. You don't need it. It's already confessed. Yes, it is. It is taken care of doctrinally. That's your standing. But your state fluctuates. And if you want nothing between your soul and your Savior, then you ought to learn the principle, even in Paul's epistles, that make it crystal clear that, 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 uh, that we're to confess our sins. Read 1 Corinthians 11. 
And that's why it says, for this cause many sleep, and for this cause many are sick, and so on. Notice, if you would, because of a forgiving grace, he was, there was a feast instead of a funeral. Verse 22, he found reconciliation. Look at verse 22, if you would. But his father said to his servant, bring forth, I love this, the best robe, and put, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and put shoes on his feet. This robe is a picture here, folks. Get this. It's a picture. It's a picture of righteousness. It's a picture of purity. He's all dirty from the pig pen, and he says, hey, get for, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. He's all dirty. No, 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 it's a covering. It's a picture like the righteousness of Christ. You have that in Isaiah 61 is a great picture there. And then notice if you would, also they put, it says in verse number 24, put a ring on his finger. This represents his privileges. After the robe came the ring. And you know what that means? That's a picture that, that he's a joint heir with God. He's back in with the Father and everything that's his, everything that's the Father's is his. And then also lastly, notice if you would, the shoes, the shoes. This represents his position. He gives him some shoes. The father calls for the shoes to be brought forth, put on his son. This boy returned home desiring to be just a mere hired servant, but the father's determined to recognize his position as a son. I think it's similar to what the psalmist said. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. The last thing was the father said, kill, kill the fatted calf. For this my son was dead, but now he's alive again. So instead of a wasted life, the father was celebrating a life redeemed and a life restored. Everything that was missing in the pig pen was given to him when he returned home. As we think about this passage, you know, I kind of maybe went through a little bit quick, but as you think about that passage, just kind of ask yourself the question, be transparent. Where am I this morning? Where am I? Where am I this morning? Am I underneath that protection and that provision of the Father? Have I, have I said to the Father, give, 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 and, and, and just taken from him and everything I've got from him, I heap it upon my own lust, as you read about in the book of James. Is that, is that what I've done? Is that what I've done? I think it's fair to say, God, search my heart as the psalmist did in Psalm 51, search my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me. Search my heart, try me. He says, and then he says, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. I wanna close with this story. A few years ago, I saw a documentary on the Amish. And the Amish, they, 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 they raised their kids in their in their, um, on their property and in their homes and what have you. And, and when the kids hit a certain age, 18, those children have a decision to make. Do they want to stay and, and be with the family and, and be a part of what they're doing there and, and accept what they've been taught from a child? Or they give them the choice to make their own decision. And they can go off and, and what they would depict is go into the world and do all those things and what have you. And no doubt all the parents and all the families want the kids to stay home. That's part of their culture. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about you know, Amish, negative or positive, but that's part of the culture of what they do. But the interesting thing in this documentary is what the families would do when a son would make the decision that I don't want to be a part of this family and I want to go out and do my own thing. Every single night when they have dinner as they sit around, they always put a setting, place setting, plate and forks and all this. They set that there and they leave it there every single time they have dinner together as a family. And as I watched that, I just kind of pictured God in heaven who loves us, who wants the best for us. And he says to us, he says, you know what? There's a place at the Father's table for you. 
I'm full of grace and compassion. And any time that you want to come home, I'm here for you. And as I mentioned, I have no idea where you are this morning. I, I don't know. Maybe this message in here was for one person, just for one person that needed this truth. I have no idea. But I think it's fair for us to take inventory and, and say, God, where am I and where would you have me to be? And what can I learn from this passage? Let's bow in prayer this morning.